So thank you everybody for coming back. It's the last session of the day. I stand between you and having a drink, so the pressure's on. We are nominally scheduled for 60 minutes. I don't know if we want to do 60 minutes, not least because uh, Esther has been communicating solidly for about a week now, and it almost, it almost seems cruel. But we have uh, plenty to talk about today in our panel session. Um, the, uh, as you did also say this morning that uh, you liked these because they were going to be serious conversations and not a panel where someone just talks for 20 minutes and we hope something comes out of it. So we'll do our best on that one as well. Who's on our panel? Well, we have a uh, returning friend this morning, Esther Duflo for MIT, Chair of uh, Poverty and Public Policy at the Collège de France, co-founder of JPAL, the director of JPAL. I think there was a Nobel Prize in there as well, somewhere along the way. Um, and uh, we are also joined by Toma Melonio, who is the Executive Director for Innovation, Strategy and Research at the French Development Agency. That's uh, Agence Française de Développement. And uh, so, uh, first of all, Toma, um, for people who don't know how AFD works, could you explain what you get involved in, how you get involved, how you do it? Okay, sure. Hello, everybody. Just in two words, maybe. So AFD is a government agency. Uh, we're doing grants, loans, research, private sector financing, and also technical assistance. So uh, AFD is a group with the main uh, agency doing grants and loans, so being a development bank and a development agency. But also we have subsidiaries involved in technical assistance uh, and private sector financing. And um, from your, so from your point of view, you do at the micro end and the macro end, you're involved, yeah. Yeah, uh, absolutely, we do some, we can pro provide financing to governments, but also provinces or cities, uh, as well as uh, local NGOs or research, uh, research teams. So it can be relatively small grants at the micro level, but also do some counter-cyclical macro loans, in particular, it's the, it was the case during the COVID pandemic. Mm. Now we'll get on to some of the macro stuff later on, but one of the things I wanted to start off with is something that you are both very much involved with, which is the FID program. Actually, maybe <laughs> Esther should have started because uh, it was uh, initially her ID. Um, so maybe uh, I'll take the, the, the I'll, I will tell the story from AFD side. So um, I, I'll skip the Esther's part, but, but she, she's going to talk about it later. Uh, so what we had observed, in particular, um, uh, taking from a Parliament mission held by Hervé Berville, was that other, uh, in particular, grant agencies, uh, USAID, but also DFID, had been involved in the setting up of innovation funds, which in both cases actually were hosted but not integrated within these uh, agencies. The reason for that is that we wanted to be able to uh, fund, but not necessarily select. It's actually Hester and Pascaline over there who are uh, first and foremost responsible for the selection and processes, but they are hosted within uh, AFD's headquarters. The purpose is, that is to be able to uh, identify the most innovative and impactful projects which do not necessarily go well into normal AFD procedures. Uh, sometimes because they are too small in size, J just to give you an example, uh, the average grant at AFD is between five and six million. This is because international projects are, e are expensive to monitor, for example, but it means it can cut AFDs off from the most innovative actors uh, in the developing world. So being able to connect with such actors, and th that's one uh, objective. And the second objective is to be able to monitor more closely the impacts of such uh, relatively small to medium-sized grants. And a few objectives that, in my, I mean, at least on my side, came along the way and probably are going to take more traction is also to help developing countries uh, innovate by themselves and develop a capacity to evaluate the impact of their own uh, public policies, uh, which is not necessarily what was at the core of, of DIV, for example, within a uh, USAID or GIF uh, with DFID and uh, or FCDO and others, uh, but is becoming more and more relevant uh, at uh, FID or hosted by AFD. So when you're thinking about uh, the, um, the role of uh, international cooperation, in particular international cooperation funding, as I said this morning, at the level at which it's available, it's, it really shouldn't be 
running project, uh, it's because there is too little money for it to make a, a substantial difference. Uh, it's really, uh, given the, the funding that's available, it's really a, a pretty small fraction of the developing countries' overall budget. And most of the money that goes towards the poor around the world comes from the countries themselves. So in this respect, in, in I had the feeling f for a long time that a lot of the the question of oh is aid effective or not was not very well posed in the sense that you could do an effective project but if it's just an effective project you have to ask yourself why you're you are doing this project and what's the leverage there and in thinking about um this actually came back from the obama commission on kind of the a new proposing a new architecture for international uh, cooperation for the us and thinking about what do you want to have an AFD or an USAID for in the first place, it seems to me that it has to be to do things that the developing country governments can't do themselves, which is not running their budget. Uh, so one of that is insurance, because you saw it during COVID that the rich countries were able to spend 27% of their GDP in fiscal stimulus measures because when they go to, you know, they can borrow initially at very, very low interest rate to finance that. And they, you know, there are people pretty much very ready to lend to rich countries. Uh, but if the poor countries are willing, to, <laughs> they're maybe perfectly willing to spend a lot, more, a lot of money to support their population as well, but nobody's willing to give them any money to do it. So the low income countries spend about 2% of their portfolio in, um, in fiscal stimulus measures. And uh, I think, I don't know for a fact, but I think it's part of the reason why the rich country were able to take off relatively quickly, or even quite quickly, and in you know a little bit chaotic, but reasonably good conditions immediately after the pandemic receded, while the poor countries were kind of uh, engulfed into a sort of maelstrom uh, that, of course, then was made worse by the uh, Russia, Russian invasion of Ukraine and uh, the debt crisis. But... Uh, in the first place, they didn't have money to support their population. So it seems to me that a first role that the international like aid could really play is that is to be available uh, for insurance in case of big crisis. We de beautifully demonstrated during the COVID crisis that we are not set up to do that. Uh, since it didn't happen, discussions happened to do something with the DST. Those discussions kind of arrived at the semi somewhere month after the biggest emergency was passed. And on balance, the, 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 the flux didn't really uh, go towards the, the poor country. So we were not very good on that. The second place where uh, uh, international cooperation can, can help, or should be there, is international public goods. Uh, uh, so that's, say, vaccines. Uh, so that's another place where we didn't do great. Um, and then the third place, is uh, another uh, specific form of international international public good, which is knowledge and innovation, and how do you, you know, what's how can you take a great idea that was uh, tried in Ghana and see whether it could apply to Ethiopia or, or India or something like that, and um, in that. Uh, why uh, there would be a role for the international, either multilateral or bilateral organization to play a role for two reasons. Number one is because it's knowledge. It's, it has some amount of externalities that would be under provided by any individual actor. Because there, and, and number two, for a government that is very, very strapped for money, justifying to their population that they are trying out some things, but it might fail and so on with their own budget is really difficult. So either you go on tried and true things, if there are some, um, which, which is good as well, but and if they are not, you certainly don't uh, make a big deal of the fact that it has not succeeded the way you wanted. Hence, and that's the third pool, and that's the one on which I had worked in the Obama Commission, is this, you know, how can we uh, support uh, innovation and the idea was that the, 
the at this time was for USAID should be uh, thinking like a venture capitalist for social innovation. So basically, should be thinking about this portfolio approach, which is a lot of the ideas that are going to be tried out are going to fail, uh, but it's okay. Uh, some of them will succeed, and then those that succeed will do uh, uh, potentially a lot of good. And you know, in the social in the impact venture world, it's uh, make a lot of money for their owner. In the social venture world, is would make you know create a lot of social benefits uh, for the world. So that's kind of was the the concept that we proposed then, and then uh, uh, DIV was created not necessarily based on that. Uh, in fact, DIV existed before uh, this uh, commission was finished. But what we could do in the commission is start doing the groundwork for showing that uh, DIV does fit this uh, this bill, and that uh, uh, the um, some of uh, many of the innovations fail but some succeed, and the one that succeeds, succeed at a level that is, uh, you know, reaches millions and millions of people and generates, soci you know, enough social benefits to uh, account for about, I think, 17 times the cost of the entire DIV portfolio in the first few years, which is what Michael Kramer discussed at the, at the colloquium uh, last. So I had that in mind. Uh, then Hervé Baville was, was working on this report, and he came to talk to me, and I... I kind of uh, uh, explained that to him and sent him to Michael, and then that kind of made its way uh, into uh, um, into what is uh, feed today. And uh, I agree with Thomas that I think kind of the feed 2.0 <laughs> would include uh, thinking about how because uh, the way what is really wonderful about div and feed, and Thomas said it, but it's really worth emphasizing that. It is so hard for anybody to get money for, from, from the World Bank. You just cannot. Like, there's no way you apply to the World Bank. Uh, you have to be in the World Bank to push a project there. Uh, USAID, in principle, there are grant mechanisms, but they are very, you know, they're not very, you have to be, feel, sign so many papers and all that, that it's really a small uh, industry. They're called the Beltway Bandits that are able to kind of get close to the USAID money. And in comparison, uh, both uh, DIV and FEED are so open. So in just two years, uh, FEED got 2,000 proposals. That doesn't mean we fund 2,000 proposals, but we get them. And the proposals that were funded come from all over the place. Uh, in particular, the beauty of FEED is that it's, in, it's really as open <laughs> francophone Africa in a way that was not, where there wasn't really no source for them to apply before. Uh, but then what's like, What's kind of the next step is to make sure that there is enough capacity to actually run this project without collaboration you know, from you or me or, or people like that. And that's kind of what we are hoping to, to work on along with JPAL and, uh, in the next, uh, in the next year, few years. Maybe just to comment, so I'd like to rebound on what Esther just said on the magnitude of ODA, so Official Development Assistance, relative to the size of the economies in, in, in uh, emerging economies. Uh, in, in a recent paper, I built a, a little chart, and just to give you a few of the numbers, in low-income countries, ODA represents 10% of GDP, which is not nothing, but not huge. In lower-middle-income countries, it's 0.6%, and in upper-middle-income countries, it's 0.06%. Which means, uh, in low-income countries, well, still you have that that idea that was originally the the, the rationale for for ODA, which is a sort of an invest to to, to fill an investment gap, but still it's relative uh, comparable. To, I mean, compared to to GDP. In uh, middle-income countries, uh, then it's. Uh, I think the story is, is is all about innovation or bringing in new ideas because uh, you don't uh, you don't fill a financing gap with 0.6 percent of GDP. It, it's it's just not true. Um, and I in the recent colloquium that just uh, Esther mentioned uh, uh, right now, uh, I like the idea that some innovation might actually complement uh, domestic funding or, or loan funding, but seriously increase the overall return of public investment. Just give me an. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, uh, Michael Kramer, for example, mentioned the fact that uh, pills to treat water uh, could be distributed in existing uh, health uh, systems. Um, 
which with a very high return. So first, it's interesting to have a, a small project with a very high return, but it also increases the general return, social return, sorry, of a more general investment that will need to be done as well at the end of the day. Maybe we'll have a smaller return per se, but if you complement them with a, a few existing uh, or a few ideas and maybe uh, innovative services, then you may strongly uh, uh, make the case for uh, more social investment uh, where the, the immediate return might be lower if you don't integrate a few ideas that, that are going to complement something that will be need to be financed probably mostly on domestic resources. That, that's one point. And the second point, at AFD we're trying to invest in uh, local or national financial uh, systems as well. Uh, because at the end of the day, developing countries will finance most of their development through taxes, but also what we observe as uh, strongly missing in the process is the capacity to collect savings and to, so to earmark sa savings towards development. In, ma in many countries, you don't have postal savings or, or, um, or savings accounts, which typically in France, but also in Italy or in Germany, uh, make up for an important part of public investment. It's not necessarily only through taxes, it's also through the capacity to collect savings in the financial system, including with uh, public development banks like uh, Caisse des Depots in France, which is more than 200 years old, and to finance uh, a few uh, public uh, purposes based on the collection of savings. So investing in the, in the foundation or development of local public development banks, whether for agriculture, social housing, SME financing, is a way to leverage upon scarce resources uh, to expand the capacity of developing countries to finance uh, their own development. I'll, I'll add two things to that. First of all, another example that was given at the conference is from is Ariana, Le Ariana Legovini from the World Bank, who talked about infrastructure. So a ton of money in FD goes to do a large, big infrastructure project, same thing with the bank. And she, that represents about half, I think she said it represents about half of the um, uh, budget of the bank, outlay of the bank is in large infrastructure project. And uh, she had the kind of uh, the grandmother of this fund at the World Bank called Dime where they're working with uh, developing countries to run uh, uh, mostly RCTs on various innovation. And they have many on how to improve access to this infrastructure by people. And their kind of overall finding across all of this project is that you could double the, the effectiveness of this, in, in, of this infrastructure for the, in terms of benefits to the people with relatively small intervention that facilitate the last meter once they are so basically you can go from, you can improve, you can improve tremendously the investment in infrastructure by, with add-on, some work we did with Pascaline on, uh, on uh, uh, water infrastructure in, in, uh, in Morocco was exactly along this line, which is, you know, all the money on the infrastructure, the pipes and so on was there and then people weren't uh, um, applying to get their connection because that was too complicated to do. One sees how, you know, unless you have innovation uh, in this, this gets, uh, and unless what is counted at the end is whether or not people uh, benefit from the service, then you can have a lot of, uh, a lot of waste. The other thing is, it's, rela it's related to what you said about the, um, the capacity to, do, to levy their own, uh, to levy money, their savings, there is taxes as well. And there, it's, I'm sorry, I keep referring back to that colloquium, but because there were a lot of uh, useful comments to that. So the, the, uh, there was a minister from uh, Côte d'Ivoire who had been minister of the budget and what is now a secretary uh, to the president. And he mentioned something which is very striking when you work uh, on, on uh, development economics, which is uh, lower, uh, lower income countries have much lower tax collection as a fraction of GDP than richer countries. So it's about 25% for the low-income country when it's, uh, or, or, and then the lowest are even lower than that. I, I think he said 25% for Côte d'Ivoire, but that might be 17. Anyway, some kind of relatively low number. And that's not a choice, like in the US also have a very low tax to GDP, but that corresponds to their ideology. But in most poor countries, it's just that they don't have the kind of capacity to collect taxes. And this is w a place, this kind of tax collection and improving the, improving the effectiveness of tax collection where there have been a lot of very exciting work uh, in the last uh, few uh, years, including in Senegal by uh, uh, people from, from uh, PSC and um, uh, in Pakistan. And now I'm working uh, on a project in, in India on that. 
but it's 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 kind of um, it's also a margin on which I don't think it was very clear until a few years ago you could innovate, uh, but you can, and it's beyond sending tax reminders like they are doing here, because there is much more progress that can be done. Thomas, can I ask you something? that moves right to the other end of the scale on this, because what upsets all of these great plans, these innovations, is unsustainable debt levels. And there are many of the countries with which you deal at the moment have unsustainable debt levels in, in this interest rate environment. How much does that worry you? What are you doing about it? Well, it does worry me uh, for a number of reasons, but um, First, if you look at the long-term cycle of debt in developing countries, we've seen in the 80s and 90s a strong increase in debt, uh, which eventually led to bankruptcies or, or, and the need for restructuring. It took more than 10 years to actually reduce the debt level in developing countries. And now we're almost back at the place where we were in the early 2000s. Not exactly there, but, but still, uh, because at the time, the, the stock of debt was roughly um, equal to what we observe now, but the general interest rate was still lower. But unfortunately, now that we, we're beginning to have sort of uh, long uh, trend in increase in interest rates, um, the, the average cost of debt is uh, again uh, climbing and may if interest rates were to stay for a long period of time uh, at the level where they are now, then we could uh, we could see probably a bigger wave of of, um, of uh, bankruptcies or, or or countries going into debt distress. Uh, out of the roughly 70 countries uh, with the lowest uh, income level, we see uh, about a third now in uh, debt distress or, or high level of uh, uh, um, high level of risk of um, and 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 then we are in a more complex situation to restructure debt now than we were in the early 2000s. Uh, that's because many countries have taken euro bonds or dollar bonds, but actually, let's say bonds in foreign currencies, which is not necessarily a great idea, in particular when the interest rates are very high. Uh, plus, we have to uh, we have to take the Chinese factor into account. Um, and uh, typically at the Paris Club, you could discuss uh, with a relatively small number of countries uh, the stock of debt. And now, uh, I think it's the, the core of the strategy of the Paris Club is precisely to find a particular role for China, which is an observer, but not a member of the Paris Club, so that we manage to find common ground to restructure debt of the countries that need it. Uh, one important outcome of the uh, last week's summit is that the debt of Zambia, which actually needed for Paris Club participation plus uh, China, um, um, I mean, last week uh, meetings allowed to, uh, to actually find an agreement of, on the restructuring of uh, the Zambian debt. If you've seen pictures of the Zambian president, he went back to Lusaka and was hosted with a big, <laughs> important welcome uh, because they have lived now for they have lived now for three years without any some so, any sort of agreement and were entirely cut from any possibility to uh, to invest. Uh, and the disagreement is is possible because the rules have changed. So now it's been decided typically which Chinese policy banks will be immediately concerned with the debt restructuring, uh, which are not. So in short, it's Exim Bank in the first wave and, and CDB, the Chinese Development Bank, uh, as a, considered as a commercial bank. Plus, there was some sort of uh, burden sharing agreement between bilateral actors and multilateral development banks. It's always a complex process, but uh, in the current situation with the uh, Chinese-US uh, relationship being uh, so tense, uh, I think everyone wanted to have an agreement whereby each of these actors has the impression that the others <laughs> are not losing more or less than they are. So it's uh, burden sharing is a long, usually long and difficult discussion, but uh, um, in the case of Zambia, an agreement uh, has been found. But I can go into the details, but it's a two-step process whereby there will be an IMF program for the first, I think, two or three years. And depending on the economic conditions at the end of this period, the parameters of the debt restructuring might, might change. In short, it's a relatively light restructuring so far. It could be a bigger one in case uh, the economic situation in Zambia doesn't uh, get better, uh, which allowed to avoid what we call the holdover problem where no one really wants to restructure debt and does nothing. So here, a two-step process uh, allowed to find a common ground. I mean, it is inevitable that China will be more and more involved because it is more and more involved in the economies of low-income countries now uh, that's tricky that oh, i noticed also at the the summit you discussed uh, 
other ways in which you can make uh, debt more sustainably, you can extend borrowing to countries that are suffering, for example, from the impacts of the climate crisis. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Oh, yeah, it, it, it relates to what uh, Esther mentioned earlier, the need in particular for providing more finance at, uh, during bad times, during a financial crisis. So uh, you may remember that in 2021, um, the IMF created uh, special drawing rights. Uh, however, the special the SDRs, they are being distributed based on uh, quotas at the IMF. So 650 billions of SDR were created, but out of that 650, only 33, for example, went to Africa in general, and 24 billion to uh, South Sub-Saharan Africa. So not much out of this uh, 650 billion. Uh, it, and it's entirely uh, related to the quota share uh, at, the, at the IMF. So at the time, uh, President Macron said that we should try to reallocate some of this SDR as a counter-cyclical uh, source of uh, financing for developing countries. Uh, and during the summit, it, it's been a very, very long negotiation, but now we are almost close to 100 billions of uh, SDR, which will be reallocated. So you can compare that favorably if you look at uh, the initial general allocation of SDR so that's three times more than the general allocation, at least for the, Afri the, the part going to Africa. Uh, ODA, just to fix the numbers, is uh, roughly 200 billion per year. So it's a, it's a significant increase. Uh, so I think it's good to share the liquidity in hard currencies uh, when, uh, when you have a financial crisis. However, it's not massive relative to the population and needs of a developing countries. So sort of half empty, half full glass. <laughs> Yes, Esther, because yeah, you were talking about 500 billion in terms yeah, of this. Yes. It's a, it's, a yeah, it's, a it's a different 500. I wanted to say uh, just a word about debt because uh, one might have the impression that uh, countries uh, suffer debt crisis now because they have been irresponsible in the past and so on. Uh, but it's worth pointing out that uh, the debt crisis in the country in that we are experiencing now is. Uh, a byproduct of uh, the increase in interest rate and then the increase in the in the dollar in the value of the dollar, which are themselves a byproduct of the fact that the central bank in the U.S. or the European Central Bank have a mandate that includes balancing inflation and unemployment in their jurisdiction and do not have a mandate to care about anybody else in the world. And so to me, this debt crisis, a bit like the <laughs> climate crisis, is completely coming from outside uh, uh, in, this, uh, in the sense that there is nothing that the countries did in the last few years to deserve this increase in interest rate. They didn't even spend any money on themselves during the COVID, during the COVID crisis. So uh, it's kind of one of these examples that we are, we, are, we are seeing. Of course, climate is the biggest one in terms of the, the, the scale, but we've seen with COVID, uh, COVID would not have been a catastrophe in Africa from a, from a health point of view, it seems, but it was an economic catastrophe. Again, so it, and they, they, sh they were basically told you have to shut down the, the, your country like to protect the whole of the world but they weren't compensated for that. And then we have the, the, of course, the war between Russia and Ukraine has nothing to do with Africa. And then we have the, and then we have the debt crisis. So it's a series of events where uh, you feel that the, 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 the most vulnerable people that have absolutely nothing to do with the reason of the problem get the hurt the most. And uh, I'm sensitive to the fact that we are trying, but if the outcome is Zambia's debt got restructured, I think like we need a bit more than, than that. <laughs> I, I'm interested if anyone's got any questions. So if you have, you can stick your hand up. I don't know if there is a person at the back with a microphone as well. Oh, there is a person at the back with a microphone. Anyone at the moment with, yes, that is Osseta. Yes, thank you. Super interesting. Um, I just had a couple of questions of, let's say, your, what are your thoughts? So you, you've mentioned, obviously, uh, climate change and the efforts that 
I mean, you haven't mentioned, but that was quite obvious, the efforts that developed countries should be doing to help um, developing countries or low-income countries. And here, I mean, when you look at the numbers with respect to commitments of Paris COP, etc., it seems like we are well below uh, the pledges. And um, I, I imagine there are lots of reasons for that, but what are your views? And how does it link with what you said about the fact that, you know, people, simple people, not states, cannot apply for a World Bank loan, etc. And where it comes to micro, the micro level of the consequences of climate change, etc., how do you square that circle and how do you make people speak at the table, you know, developing and developed for justice, quote unquote, to be made? And then I had a, a second question, which is about uh, the uh, climate-related migration. Um, and there is a, this idea that international cooperation could help, um, you know, nurturing international migration and adaptation between countries so that you could see international migration as a way also to adapt to climate change. Uh, so that's a new idea. I wonder what you have thought on that. Thank you. So there are two kinds of commitments or pledges that are made at the COPs, or many more, but kind of two for, that are relevant for us today. One is in terms of reducing the emission, and one is in terms of uh, financing towards developing countries. I don't think either of them is being uh, is being met. Uh, and of course, both of them need to be made after today, Pascaline uh, told me, uh, well, you know, it's right to say we impose a cost on the other country, but it's not that we can buy our way out of it. So. Uh, let me take this opportunity to say the first thing we need to do is to reduce the, our emission. The Prime Minister, the, the, the Minister for Digital Transformation in Togo, I keep citing people from that other colloquium, but she had a great analogy uh, about the, the submarine uh, where people uh, were trapped uh, for a few days. And she said, well, you know, in the submarine, assume, this, I think it's not the way it happened, but assume they were trapped there and they were wondering how much oxygen they have. Uh, and how many days they will survive. And uh, while they are thinking about all these things, someone uh, light a cigarette and, and continue to smoke, thereby taking this, the, the air out of the oxygen. Maybe the first thing to, to do would be to stop the cigarette. So I think that's, you know, let me clarify that I agree with this point of view. And we should, uh, we need to, uh, to be uh, 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 much more serious in limiting emission in the first place because again as I tried to say today this is where the problem is coming from is us uh, so that's that's the first point now on the pledge yes so at Paris uh, 100 billion a year were committed to developing countries they were never given they were not even renewed in Glasgow um, to the extent money was given it usually was in the form of loan rather than grants and then usually for mitigation rather than compensation or adaptation. So it's really like I'm giving you a loan so that you can mitigate climate change, which you're not responsible for in the first place. Was It's kind of highly problematic. And then uh, at Charmel Sheik, the idea of a loss and damage fund was put, uh, was put on the table, which is a good uh, start. But there was no <laughs> discussion of a mechanism to how to put money in it. And so I think the, the problem is that we saw it very clearly during COVID is that when we are hit by a crisis, we will, the, the way our political economy works is each country will put their own citizen first. And at best, the European Union will manage to get something together for the European Union. But it's not, that it's not a time where, at least, you know, and maybe the leadership can change, but in the current situation of international leadership, it doesn't look that it's a time where we're able to really do anything for the rest of the world. And hence, if we want anything to happen in terms of, uh, uh, in, in term of uh, money towards, that would go towards developing uh, countries, we need to have mechanism. Like once there is a mechanism in place that's uh, in, and that you know, there is a source of funding and that source of funding goes to that particular bucket, he knows more than me how this whole thing works. But I have a feeling that once these things are in place, place, they tend to just continue. So I think there is a lot of value in trying to have a play in place a mechanism you know, that this, this money goes to that fund. And without that, relying on you know, the goodwill of the countries to try to generate the money is not going to be very effective. That's why I've been you know, 
one could imagine many of these mechanisms, but that's why I've kind of uh, trying to socialize the idea that one could <coughs> piggyback on the in agreement for a minimum taxation of international corporation that the OECD has worked on for many years. You add a, a few percent to it, you can generate 200, 300 billion a year. You know, it would still be a very moderate level of taxation since the minimum is 15 if we went to 18, so, and then put that into a fund. If that were put in place, then no, at least you would have just kind of like a way of uh, 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 keeping uh, putting that fund on. Then there is the very uh, key question of like what you know how would you what would you do with the money and if the fund is ca can come flag the World Bank again and you, nobody can apply to it without filling uh, fifty five million of forms, uh, then maybe that would be that wouldn't be effective. Um, so I'm just starting to really think about that, but. My idea is that part of it is uh, uh, should be as automatic as possible, uh, triggered by events, and a lot of, uh, you know, during COVID, a lot of countries were able to put in place cash transfer mechanism. And sometimes they have the mechanism like Togo, but they couldn't find the money to pump into their mechanism. So a fund like that would have money to pump that country could access, you know, a bit parametrically as a function of climate condition. I think, again, like kind of trying to make things fast so that we don't have to think for six months how we are going to generate a uh, hundred or whatever uh, um, uh, would be uh, would be a productive way to, to go. Maybe just, just a few words. So, um, like Esther, I think the, the fact that developed countries did not manage to reach the hundred billions of climate finance, probably up until this year, because they might be rich this year, but uh, not in 2020, not in 2021, which is the last year for which we have the, the numbers, has been seriously damaging for, for developed countries. Uh, because at the end of the day, it wasn't that difficult to actually do it. Uh, let me remind you that the fact that these hundred billions were to be reached between 2020 and 2025. After that, there would be new ne ne negotiations to probably change that number. Uh, but there are many things <laughs> not well organized in climate finance. So the, the absolute number can be uh, is debatable, let's say. Uh, first, the list of countries that actually provide financing for climate is basically that of, that of the early 90s. But the world of, uh, the world of uh, carbon emissions has changed vastly. So, so far, typically, China is a recipient of uh, uh, climate finance, but it's the first uh, uh, emitter of, of carbon, and even in historic terms, in five years from now, now it will be a very important um, um, emitter of carbon. Uh, so probably the geography, the very ge the classification of countries could change uh, on the emitter's part, but also on the recipient's part, because uh, an important uh, uh, thing that Esther just said is that the uh, the loss and damage fund which has been created so far has very little, if any, money on it. So when a fund is created, many people say, oh, very good, the fund has been created. But if there's no money on the fund, it's just a bank account with no euros uh, or dollars or, or whatever. Uh, but of course, the increase in, in, in loss and damage uh, is sort of a new public policy worldwide which is going to I think take more importance um, and will require money, whether from taxation or other sources of funding. Uh, but so far, uh, climate finance is absolutely not structured to host for uh, massive, mostly grant resources, probably partly automatic, similar to uh, an insurance scheme, where, uh, but where the insurer is not the one ultimately paying for the insurance premium, uh, because that's some thing that a few people have in mind, but it's not going to work. So just to say that we, sh we need better reporting of climate finance and probably separate slightly better what's going to mitigation, adaptation, I mean long-term adaptation, and also answers to uh, climate shocks. So we, we've uh, seen uh, last week uh, an advance in the talks on uh, providing new financial products to uh, partic particularly suspend the repayment of, um, of um, in annual installment in uh, case of what climate shock. Pause clauses, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it, it means when you when money is lent to a country, the repayment could be suspended for one, two, or maybe more years. Uh, when, uh, in particular, a small island state is hit by a, by a disaster, because uh, otherwise a country might be struck uh, and have to borrow 
uh, have, uh, and have to borrow at very high rates, uh, even when, if, I mean, at a time when it's in a particularly poor position to actually borrow. So you may, a, a small island state typically may end up paying twice for, for the cost of a catastrophe, one by the immediate shock, but also by the accumulation of, of debt and at a particularly poor time to borrow money because of course no one wants to lend to a country uh, where GDP has been uh, has reduced by 30%, for example. So uh, the, the capacity of all funders to provide uh, innovative uh, uh, financing, I think will matter. We've seen uh, the Barbados, for example, emitting bonds where some uh, annual uh, in installments can be postponed in case of a disaster. That's on the bond emission side, but also on the loan side provided by the World Bank, AFD, uh, and others. I think it's it's important to extend that possibility. We I, yeah, because th those pause clauses will only work if everybody does it. Yeah, I yeah. mean, at AFD 10 years ago, we had some pause clauses for countries who ex that export uh, cotton. Because at the time, the, the drop in the price of cotton was a major concern, in particular in Western Africa. But we are alone in doing that, so that the, <laughs> the, the savings in, in debt service at the time were too limited. And we ended up stopping the, doing that because we were too isolated. But here, I see probably more potential for um, a bigger uh, worldwide mobilization to suspend the uh, repayment in case of a climate shock. But to be honest, it's mostly uh, for small island states because this is where uh, you will have the biggest shocks as uh, uh, I mean, relative to GDP. Yeah. Can I ask if there, if there are any other questions? Looking around. In which case, I want to ask you a, just a final thing that uh, also did bring up, and that's the role of migration in all of this. Yeah. Uh, how will we manage migration? Uh, how does it affect uh, the public perception of what the, the, the work that both of you do and how successful can it possibly be as a response? Well, to continue with my submarine, uh, at the same time of this, we were looking at the submarine, uh, um, a ship uh, sunk uh, off uh, the coast of Greece and uh, the Greece uh, marine uh, Police refused to do anything about it until, until it actually had sunk. And then when it finally had sunk, all they could do is to call some uh, yacht that was nearby, a uh, private yacht that was nearby to try and fish people out. And uh, um, to get this piece of news, you had to go past uh, Trump, uh, uh, whatever, indictment, and then the submarine, and then a few more things. And then, so it shows that how we have become uh, we have maybe we've always been, but completely inured to to uh, the, the the suffering that uh, uh, that people, uh, oh, in general, <laughs> the general suffering of, of of people coming from poor countries, uh, either when they're there or when they're on the way here. So m my view on uh, climate migration is probably that. Uh, the idea that everybody will run away from this, from countries that become hotter or, or, or uh, have uh, climate uh, problems is probably exaggerated, except for places that are going to literally go underwater. You know, a big part of Bangladesh will go underwater. People will have to move from there. Uh, but other than that, it's it's probably unlikely to me the case that vast amount of people will uh, will move just because generally people don't move; uh, they adapt uh, to a worse situation rather than going away. Um, we've seen it over and over, except when it becomes absolutely absolutely impossible to live in a place. So when there is a war, or when you know, literally your house is in the water, then people will go. Um, so it's unlikely to be either uh, uh, between you and me <laughs> in this intimate home. It's unlikely to be either a big problem or a big solution uh, in the sense that it's not, you know, I do think we should be more open to migrants. I do think nothing bad will happen if we are more open to migrants and it will avoid uh, nothing bad to our economy would happen. If we are open to migrants, we haven't, we have had many episodes of a lot of migration and pretty much no evidence that it harms uh, the local populations. So the fear about migrations are very, very uh, uh, hyped in people's mind. Um, and I also do think that in, in, in fact, the move migration movements, even if we left the whole migration open, would be much, much more moderate than we 
then uh, pe some people think, with some exception again, well, some people might disappear, then people will have to go somewhere else. Um, that said, uh, I also think that as a political economy uh, consideration, I don't see it happening <laughs> as uh, in, in rich countries, unfortunately, uh, where migration remains a huge political winner to be anti-migration for reasons that I don't fully uh, understand completely. But, um, and therefore, I think it's going to be, you know, it's, con it's, it's going to be limited and, and a lot of the migration that can happen in response to climate change is likely to be more within country. Uh, or, uh, and what we can do, uh, what uh, the countries can do or uh, with, with money from this fund, if, if we ever got money, is to make easier for countries to manage flu flux of internal migration, uh, for example, towards the city, so that the city can accommodate uh, people and uh, uh, maybe in anticipation of, of problems, either temporarily or uh, more in a more permanent fashion. Uh, if, if anything, we see that there is under migration where people would benefit from leaving uh, rural areas already we, uh, with the climate that we do have in, in low seasons, for example, either for a period of time or forever, and they don't do it because the, of a number of reasons, some of them having to do with the infrastructure that's available in the cities where the, the, the lived environment is just unbearable and the pollution is unbearable. So something that can to be done to help with climate mm -hmm. and that will take money and that will take resources is to make uh, other regions that won't be as affected or other jobs th that won't be af as affected welcome, uh, be ready to welcome people who, who might have to be moving. Well, s slightly similar to Esther, but maybe I'll say it uh, even more <laughs> uh, bluntly. Uh, I'm not so sure about all the numbers we read on climate migrants or climate displaced persons. I don't know exactly how this is supposed to be uh, <laughs> calculated. Why? Just to give you an example, we work with a number of governments on the long-term impacts of climate change. And typically you're going to look at the impact of uh, rainfall evolution on uh, hydropower, the, the impact of uh, increased temperature and maybe different uh, rainfall scheme on uh, agriculture. And we were act again discussing it uh, uh, last, last week, but the, the, the impact on, uh, of climate change on agriculture is uh, Usually, we actively and we want to estimate that we don't really have very strong micro foundations uh, to integrate within macro models. Um, just to give you an example, on Vietnam, we worked with on a scenario that uh, uh, climate change is going to be 2.5 additional degrees. So we try to esti to find other places in the world where there are uh, temperature and rainfall scheme which are equivalent to what we can find in a particular part of Vietnam. Uh, based on that, we are trying to estimate an evolution of agricultural returns to measure the ev the eventual uh, impact of uh, climate change on GDP, jobs, uh, and maybe um, uh, migration at the end of the day. But they are very strong. Uh, an important hypothesis uh, uh, just to, to make that simple uh, computation first. And, and secondly, we don't know yet exactly what the adaptation strategies of, uh, say, the agri uh, farmers will be. Um, so this is just to tell you that it's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, highly, it's very difficult to actually try to make such uh, estimation. And at the end of the day, but it's just a best guess. It's not a, I don't think it's uh, scientifically proven, but uh, I would say that probably domestic migration from rural areas to cities could be accelerated or regional migration within, let's say, West Africa, Southern Africa, Eastern Africa, could also uh, accelerate from the places where it's more difficult to live to relatively neighboring pl places where it's, uh, it's slightly easier. It's just a, a uh, an estimate based on what we actually observe <laughs> when there is a long-term drought, for example. It's uh, the, the international migration part is uh, normally limited compared with the uh, um, uh, migration to cities or to neighboring countries. This is where the most important flows actually, I mean, actually observed. So it's just based on that that I'm saying uh, probably international migration uh, related to climate change could be could be uh, could be limited, uh, but uh, again, I'm, I'm not saying it's uh, entirely uh, uh, solid uh, forecast. There are many things at the moment that you're having to forecast that are not entirely solid forecasts, but thank you very much for talking about them today. Thank you very much, Esther, as well, for g giving your point of view on it and the complementary points of view that you have as well.
we reach the end of the day. And I think everyone could do with the drinks. Let's, so let's go and have one. I would like to give you detailed information about what to do next. I don't know it. <laughs> I will do better tomorrow. But until then, you have to find your way. Thank you very much. Yeah, See. You came ahead, though, didn't you? <laughs> we could close it. Francesca. Francesca will personally deliver all of you to where you need to be. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for both our panelists. If you could give them <laughs> the thanks they deserve.